Okay, I'm going to talk about Immanuel Kant uh, today. Um, this will be my last uh, little lecture on Kant. Basically, I'll repeat a few things at the beginning. Um, uh, Kant uh, argued against Hume. Hume had argued that we cannot have knowledge of causality because we never perceive we never perceive cause and effect in the world. And also cause and effect is not a matter of relation of ideas. So Hume said we have no basis for, we have no reason to believe in causality. Kant argued that cause and effect is not in the world. It's not something we observe in the world. It's not something we can know as in terms of relations of ideas. It's something that the mind imposes on experience, the things that we experience. So Kant would say, before we even look at the world, before we look at the way things are in the world, we can know a priori, before looking, we can know a priori that any event in the world, call it A, will cause something else, call it B, and that B will have, will, in a turn, will cause something. So everything in the world, even we know, even before we look, is part of a causal network. So what Hume said, Kant says what Hume's idea, the Hume's fork, the idea that we have to choose between two alternatives, either something is a matter of fact, and which is known a, a posteriori, which can only be known by a, after observation, or something is true by definition, like all cir cir circle is circles are round, we can know that without looking at a circle. Hume says there's another, Kant said there's a third, a third uh, alternative, which is that there are some ideas which are synthetic and they are also a priori and necessary. So Kant, offers a third way instead of he offers what are called synthetic a priori truths Synth synthetic a priori that sounds kind of weird because the traditional distinction before kant that was made by hume and was made by leibniz and even locke was that you on the one hand you have re this is a Hume's vocabulary, relations of ideas, like a circle is round, a bachelor is unmarried, we can know these by simple definition. And then you have matters of fact, like it's raining outside, which can be true or false depending upon how it is in the world. So these relations of ideas are, are known a priori, and matters of fact are known a posteriori. So the idea is that matters of fact are synthetic statements in Kant's terminology. Over here, these are analytic statements. What, what Hume called relations of ideas, Kant calls uh, analytic, meaning that, for example, like a circle is round, that's an analytic definition, a statement, because if you analyze the notion of circle, it includes the notion of being round. Same thing with a, a bachelor is unmarried. If you analyze the meaning of bachelor, it includes the meaning of un, being unmarried. So these can be known a priori before actually looking at the world, and they are necessary truths because it's, nece it's necessary that a circle is round. It's not a contingent, it's, it has to be that way. Whereas synthetic statements are contingent, meaning they can be that way or not. It could be raining outside or not. So on the one hand you have synthetic, and they're called synthetic statements because, uh, because that you're relating two ideas you're, that mean different things, one idea is not included in the other one, so you're synthesizing or bringing together two 
ideas that are logically separate. Like if I say the cat is on the mat, there's nothing in the idea of cat that means that it's on the mat. If I say I drew a circle and it's red, there's nothing in the, in the meaning of circle that means it's red. So these are synthetic statements that you're synthesizing. We're bringing together statements which are not logically the same. So it seems that when you have a synthetic statement, since you're bringing together statements that are not logically the same, it seems, you know, kind of strange to, to think that you can know that they're true independent of experience. And Kant says that you there are cases where you can know that for when it comes to cause and effect, for example. The idea that everything is part of a causal network, Kant would say that you can know that a priori even though the idea that A causes B cannot be no, is not an analytic statement. It's a synthetic statement. Because there's nothing in A, the meaning of A, that suggests the meaning of B. For example, the, Hume gave the example of you, you hit one billiard ball into another billiard ball. So you've got two ideas here. You've got the motion, the idea that one ball is moving and then it hits another ball so you've got one idea of the mo the ball is moving and it hits a ball and then you have another idea that the second ball is moving and they are totally distinct ideas i mean you can imagine hitting a billiard ball into an into a billiard ball and these when you do that the second billiard ball just disappears or bursts into flame you can imagine it doing anything. Um, there's nothing logically necessary about its moving just because the first ball was moving. So these ideas are synthetic. Now, Kant is not saying that it's necessary that you know one ball is going to make the other ball move, but he does say we can know a priori that when one ball hits another ball, it will cause something in that ball to happen. To find out what happens, you have to actually look. But to know that it will cause something to happen, Kant says uh, that you can know a priori without looking. So that's an example of a synthetic a priori statement. And so that... Kant was the first person to introduce that notion. Anyway, let me say a little about Kant's um, uh, Kant's. Let me see if I can find an eraser. Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. So let me move that like here. Okay, let me ex just briefly explain how Kant looks at the whole world. Kind of like Plato. Plato splits, splits, splits the world up between the world of becoming in the world of being, you know, down here for Plato, you have the world inside the cave and outside the cave, the world of becoming and the world of being. For Kant, you have the world of phenomena and the world of noumena. The world of phenomena is the world as it appears to us, it's the world of experience. The world of noumena is the world in itself, independent of our experience. All we know about the world is the way it appears to us. We all have a body and we have five senses. So all we can know about the world outside of us is what can be filtered into our mind through our five senses. Imagine if you had ten senses. The world would be very different. It would appear very different. But we don't have ten senses. We don't have. We only have five senses. So that's all we know about reality. Kant would say we don't know anything else beyond our five senses about the world. All we know is how the world appears to us. And Kant says this is where the notion of causality operates. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. And not only that, but also 
uh, these are these are this is these are what they call categories of the understanding, but they're also forms of sensibility, which are time and space. So Kant believed with Leibniz that time and space are not in the world objectively, as uh, as Sir Isaac Newton did. Kant believes that we impose time and space onto the world. So time and space do not characterize the noumena, the things in themselves nor does causality characterize the things in themselves. These only apply to the world of appearance. For Kant, there is no way you can bridge the gap. For Plato, Plato's two worlds, you had the world of sense experience in the, in the forms. Plato believed that we could no, actually know the forms through recollection because for Plato, the soul actually before it was born into a body, actually inhabited the world of forms. For Kant, there is no way you can bridge the gap from here to here. Um, this is a complete, will always remain a question mark, completely unknown. We can have no knowledge. All knowledge for Kant is down here. Up here, Kant believes, for example, that God does it. Kant believed in God. He believed in the soul, the immortality of the soul. And he also believed in free will. But he said all of these are things that transcend experience. So we cannot know anything about them. But he did believe that we, we have to po uh, postulate them or believe that they exist. And I'll have to talk about that in another, in another lecture. But uh, he has his reasons for doing that. Kant is a transcendental idealist, meaning he's all he's looking for the conditions of possibility to explain something, explain some type of phenomenon. Uh, and Kant would say, when it comes to uh, to causality, to explain how a world is at possible for any creature whatsoever, not just human beings. But any creature, any part of the in any part of the universe, or for any animal, there has to be. Uh, you have to look at the world through cause and effect. I mean, otherwise there would be no world. Imagine a world where cause there is no cause and effect. It would not be a world of experience. It would just be utter chaos. Um, so to have a world where you can have people actually talk about it and, and live in it and have intersubjective relationship. And to be able to say anything meaningful about it, Kant would say that world has to be structured according to cause and effect. It also has to be a structure in terms of time and space. That's Kant's uh, view. So Kant, basically what Immanuel Kant does, he was the first person to do that. He basically sees the mind. Before Kant, basically the idea of truth was correspondence. The mind can know what the world outside of itself is like. It can represent the world. Uh, with Kant, uh, when it comes to causality and cause and effect and even substance, time and space, uh, our ideas of time and space, our ideas of causality, A causes B, there is no way that you can represent that as a, there's no way that our beliefs correspond to anything in the world because cause and effect for Kant and even time and space are not in the world. The mind is imposing those categories and forms of sensibility onto the world. So Kant is, uh, no one had ever said this before. Kant was a radical, very radical thinker. Uh, Hegel was going to follow Kant uh, Hegel is going to come a few years after Kant, and Hegel is going to basically reject the whole system, just like kind of like an analogy. Uh, you know, Plato had the two worlds, and then you know the uh, the world of the eternal forms, and then Aristotle came along and cut out and just chopped up the world of forms. What Hegel's going to do the same thing, similar thing to Kant. Hegel's going to chop up the noumena, just kind of get rid of it, the way that Aristotle got rid of the forms. Anyway, when I talk about Hegel, uh, I'll talk about that in more detail. So that's all for now. Right now, that's Immanuel Kant. So, uh, you know, read Kant. Think about it. You know, read the selections carefully. Uh, he's a brilliant thinker. The, one of the Plato, Aristotle, Kant, the three greatest philosophers of all time.